that's what we do as mix engineers is we unleash the potential of the song. Right? It's all in there. We got the tracks, we've got the files. Maybe they're messy, maybe they sound great. We don't have to do a lot. But knowing how much we need to do to make the song what it needs to be, that's the job. In this episode, I sat down with producer and engineer Paul Willie Green Woolmack. As the in house engineer at Backwood Studios, he recently mixed the latest Elucid album, I Told Bessie. Be sure to stick around because Paul and I dive into the session where he shares the techniques and tools that went into mixing this album. You can download the album on Bandcamp or stream it wherever you get your music. My name is Paul Womack, professionally known as Willie Green. I'm a producer, engineer, mixer, kind of do a little bit of everything uh, from here in Brooklyn, New York. This is my studio, The Greenhouse. I come from a bit of a musical family. Uh, my grandfather, unfortunately I didn't know was a, was a singer, um, kind of imbued that in his son, my godfather, my uncle, uh, my uncle David. And so he's a musician, uh, now he lives in Vegas and performs and, um, you know, he gave me my first drum machine. He gave me my first keyboard when I was like six. He bought me my first drum kit. He was always there to have some kind of instrument for me uh, so I could do something. You know, uh, he always says, "Well, I needed a drummer, so I got you a drum kit early." And then when I was fifteen, I was in the band. Really? Yeah. Wow, cool. Yeah. So you know, I was tall enough to be able to sneak into clubs and whatever in Hartford, uh, where I'm from, from Hartford, Connecticut originally. And so yeah, you know, I would load in. I would play the set, set breaks, sit out in the van so no one saw some 16-year-old sitting at the bar. And, you know, we did that. We did that for a while. I played with him from when I was 15 till I was 25, um, when I finally got busy enough, busy enough with my own stuff to, to um, just not have time, you know? Do you feel like that experience in music and developing that musicality have, has served you in the audio engineering world? Oh, 100%. You know, uh, my uncle's band was a cover band, and we did a lot of Motown, we did a lot of reggae, we did a lot of Top 40. Um, so just as a musician, it was a great training and understanding, okay, well, these are the songs that make people dance. These are the songs that people love. When they go out on a Friday night or on a Tuesday night or whatever, these are the songs that people want to hear, um, you know, and the reasons for that, I think, are super valuable from a production standpoint. Um, why we love the music that we love. Once you unlock that as a producer, then you can make great records because you know what's going to resonate with the artists, uh, with the artist fan base. You know, everything isn't only about catering to them. But if you don't pay attention to what your fan base wants as a creator, then what are we doing here? You know, like... Yeah, selfish content doesn't help anybody. No. It comes to who it's for, ultimately. Do you, have you boiled that down to five points, or is it really a felt thing? No, nah, it's a field thing. If I had the five points, I would bottle that and sell it and then retire to an island somewhere, you know? Um, but I feel like you can't... You can only bottle but so much information in the audio world, in the music world, in the art world, really, because what moves me artistically may not move you in the same way. And it doesn't mean that either one of us is wrong, but, you know, I either need to make my art as general as possible so everybody can feel it, or just accept that it's not for everybody. And I've kind of leaned in that direction. I don't need my art to be for everybody. Um, because what I like, I like challenging music. I like songs you hear them and you're like, yo, I love that. I don't know why. I don't know what it means. So let me play it another five times and figure it out. Um, that's exciting, you know, because that's, to me, that's where the art part exists. Uh, surface level stuff is cool and it's necessary and you need that surface level interest to want to dig in more. But I want something to dig in, too. Don't give me a little shallow pool. Let me dive all the way in, right? Um, and some people probably like something different. That's one thing that's great about the internet, right? Is yeah. that you can reach so many people. You'll reach your people if you're honestly trying to create mm -hmm. art and, and something that's enjoyable. Yeah. And you'll find your people. To me, right? to me, that's where it is. I mean, that's the artistic integrity. And, like, it's a phrase that we hear a lot, but, like, that's what it is. What are you serving? 
what is the purpose of what we're doing here? And for me, and I know it's, especially in the 21st century music industry, and it's an industry very much, I'm here, to, I'm here for the art part. Yeah, I want to make money. Money is cool. We all like that. I want to put food on my table. That's important for my family. And I like sneakers. And I got to, you know, I need, sneakers cost dough. I'm an American, so I'm a capitalist. I'm a consumer to some degree. Like, that's kind of part of the game. Uh, but it's not about just the money for me, right? If it was, I wouldn't make indie rap for a living. Because making indie rap for a living already is a bit of an oxymoron. Um, I've been lucky to stay linked up with great creative people that allows my career to flourish along with theirs. Can you tell me maybe one of the impactful people in your life since your uncle? Oh, yeah. I mean, Billy Woods uh, is number one. First, as an artist, he's easily one of the best rappers on the planet and I know that's a very loaded statement and all your listeners are like yo how can you say that what about this person I'm not here to argue uh the way he raps is the way the music sounds in my light in, in my head and in my heart and in my life like the way that that he does it because he does I'm still picking up lyrics from woods from records we did 15 years ago I'll listen back and I'm like Oh, that's what you meant there. I never got that till now because I had to read six more books and watch some documentaries and now I understand the shit that you were spending 15 years ago. But that's exciting because I can go back to those records now and have a different understanding, right? So artistically, Woods is a huge impact. And we're actually gonna, about to talk about an Elucid album that you just worked on that, yeah. that he's featuring in. Yes, right? well, he's featuring in, but the other thing is that Woods owns the label. Okay. He co-owns the label, Backwoods Studios. And I've been working with Backwoods since like 2008. When I moved to New York in 2007, the first thing I did was send an email to Backwoods. It's like, hey, I just heard this album that you all put out. It was an older group of uh, Woods called Supercron Flight Brothers. And they had this album called Emergency Powers. And I had bought it. It's back in the days where you would buy a CD like without hearing it because there's no streaming. You would just buy a CD like, oh, that looks cool. Or I heard somebody say that was cool and you didn't know what you were going to get. Hey, let's try it out. Yeah, you know, like that, that doesn't happen anymore. That's not how we consume music. We're sight unseen, song unheard. You would buy an album. And I read about this thing on OK Player and I was in a record store, which is also weird now. And I was like, oh, I'm just going gonna, gonna to buy this thing. And I heard it. And I didn't get it at first. I was like, yo, I just wasted 15 bucks or whatever. Like, I don't get this. I don't like this or whatever. Um, and then a friend of mine at the time was like, yeah, but put on track six or whatever it is. Put on that Rent Control song. There's a song on there called Rent Control. And I listened to it again. And I really tried to listen to the lyrics. And it was like a switch flipped. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. Oh, yo, I get this now. And it kind of unlocked the whole album for me because Woods has a very kind of off-kilter, almost out-of-time flow and stretches bars and stretches forms and stretches arrangements. And it's like, now that I'm open to this, I'm getting everything that's happening here and it's blowing my mind and I have to know more. And so I moved to New York and I emailed the label. And at the time, I didn't know that Woods was running it. Um, and, you know, I sent over a bunch of beats, all this kind of stuff. And then the main thing I did, and for everybody watching, for all my students, everybody I talked to, the main thing I did is I followed up. I sent the email when I got to New York, and I didn't get a response. And it's like, oh, man, do they not like my beats? Oh, blah, 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 they're too big for me, X, Y, and Z. And then I followed up. And Woods has even said in interviews, he was like, yo, the biggest thing that ever happened is that Willie Green emailed twice. Because I had missed the first one for whatever reasons in life. We all miss emails. And had you ever talked to him before emailing him initially? Never. Never. I just, I wrote to, I don't know, it was 07. So back with studios at Hotmail or whatever. That's not the email address anymore. 
But you sent him a first email and then yeah. it got lost in I, thousands, I wrote right? and I was like, hey, I just heard Emergency Powers. I love this album. I just moved to New York. I'm a producer, and engineer. I was coming down from Boston. Here are some links to things I've done, X, Y, and Z. And it just kind of got lost in the shuffle. And then I followed up and I said, hey, just want to check in, sent this stuff. And that's when they reached back out. They saw that and like, oh, well, let's get a meeting. These beats sound cool or whatever. And we've been working together for the last 15 years. Wow. Um, yeah, you know, because digital communication is a weird thing because you throw a message out to somebody in essentially like the digital ether and hope that they get it and hope that they get the right tone that you had, hope that they respond in a tone that you're open to because, you know, you might get an email... And I used to get frustrated when I would get emails from people about, like, mixed revisions. Oh, I don't like the snare. And I'd be mad. What you mean you don't like the snare? And it's like, yo, you don't know the type of, you don't know what kind of day the person who wrote that email was having. They might have had a real bad day. They might have lost their job. They might have X, Y, and Z, dropped their ice cream cone. Like, we don't know. And then they write back notes on your mix. Yeah, the bass sucks. We don't know where they're coming from. Or I might have had a bad day and dropped my ice cream cone, and then I read their notes and I'm like, yo, well, this person, you know, blah, 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 you know, like, you have to take all of that humanity, into humanity out of communication, which is the weirdest thing I think I've ever said. Yeah. Right? <laughs> take the right. humanity out of communication so you can understand what they're talking about. And none of this makes any sense, right? So learning these kind of interactions, how we interact on the internet and what all that means um, is important. And the biggest thing is like, don't take it personal. You know, when I didn't hear back from Backwoods at first, I'm like, well, these, these cats, they, they think they're so big X, Y, and Z. Nah, man, they just missed the email. Nobody blew me off. I didn't have to feel any kind of way. You know, it's, you kind of have to separate that stuff. That's good. At that time in your career, all those previous failures where oh, they didn't they didn't respond, they they prepared you to be like, all right, oh, let's yeah. just come back and send yeah. another email. I really want to make this happen. Yeah, because that perseverance is what it takes. You know, I had just moved to New York and I'm trying to reach out to everybody I can. I'm trying to find work in a major recording city where everybody is trying to find work. Like it's hard. Uh, so that persistence is very important. There's a difference between persistence and annoyance. Like, I've had people reach out like, yeah, I figured I would just annoy you until you wrote me back. It's like, let's, let's phrase that a little bit different. I'm not, I don't want to be annoyed, but I've got stuff going on. You know what I mean? So you follow, and you, you, you follow up and, and, and try and stay connected. And it's important to communicate with people like they're real people. You know? Um, like, I'm a regular person. Just say what's up. Um, you know, and I found like the biggest networking thing for me is reaching out to folks when you don't need something. If you reach out without your handout, then it's like, okay, this is just a cool ass person. Especially like the bigger the person, the bigger the entity, the more people are probably hitting them up wanting stuff, right? But if I'm just like, hey, really appreciate your work on this, thought it was super dope, just want to reach out and say peace. And just leave it right there. It's a quick thing. Probably took me 15 seconds to write it. But whoever got that message is probably like, oh, shit. Well, that was cool. Um, they just said, what's up? You know, that's the kind of thing that I'll respond to. Oh, yo, I really appreciate that. I love that mix, too. Or whatever. As, a po as opposed to, yo, I really love your work. Yo, you think that I could mix a record on the next? Like, why would why would? No, you know, like, why would I, like, I don't, like, I don't know you like that to, like, automatically just be giving my time or my energy or work or whatever. It's like, how do you interact with people? How would you interact with a person in real life, right? That's what we forget with the digital stuff. Um, if you email me and you want something, introduce yourself. Hey, I'm so-and-so. I do this, I'm a fan of X, Y, and Z that you've done. Hey, I need a record mixed. My budget might be low, whatever. Like, but if you come through like, yo, man, like you think you could mix my record for X, Y, and Z? It's like, nah, because I don't even know you and like you just came to me asking me for a discount. Like, I don't like you wouldn't even say hi, my name is. Would you do that to a stranger? Like you just walk up like, yo, give me three hundred dollars? 
No. Well, what you ask me for a discount for? Because it's it's the same thing, right? Um, so just that inner just acting like you would act with a person. If you just DM me a link to your music, I will never listen to it. If you just send me an unsolicited link, I don't know you, dog. Why do I care about your link? Is that even a reasonable thing to be like? Like, what, I got to now do research and figure out who you were and what your music sounds like to decide if I want to listen to this song? I'm not doing that. I'm doing whatever else is going on in my day. You know, it's just like, how do you approach people and that kind of thing? We can't forget how real people, how real people act. It's important, you know? Well, we're going to get into this Elucid album, the new one that just came out, I Told Bessie. Is yes. That right? Yep. Yep. Um, and so what role did you play or what roles did you play in um, this album? I engineered the album. I didn't do any production on this one. I've been doing a little bit less production and more focusing on engineering as of late. Um, and Elucid has a long reach to get incredible production. Like the album is not missing anything. Like oh, well, I need to get a joint. The album did not need me in that way. But I read. I recorded all of Elucid's vocals here. Um, I then edited, mixed, and mastered the album. Um, except for one song, Sardonyx, the fourth song, I think, was mixed by Steel Tip Dove. But the rest of it, uh, I, I, I mixed here. So, yeah, I'm the in-house engineer for Backwood Studios. The majority of their albums that, that come out, I mix. Uh, I've mastered everything they've put out for last 10, 12 years or so. And, yeah, I'm kind of... That's that's my job. Uh, How would you define that job? What's the purpose of the mixing engineer? Purpose of the mixing engineer, you know, short answer is to make it sound good. But in the modern in modern music industry, that could be a lot of things. You know, um, we all start wearing more and more hats. So I'm editing. So maybe I'm doing noise reduction. You know, on a certain things, so especially. Because, because of the pandemic, uh, we didn't have this issue here with the Lucid because I cut his vocals here. A lot of people are recording themselves at home. I've gotten a lot better removing dog barks and sirens and all kinds of car sounds from out of people's records. I had this one album I did last fall, recorded at home in the pandemic. Now, I don't know where this artist was living, but maybe next to a racetrack is literally, you would hear, zoom, zoom, like through the back of like the lead vocal in the bridge. So I had to go in and I had to scrub all that out because that's, you know, <laughs> the song was not about car racing. And so therefore it's got to go, you know, so that's something that kind of stuff is hypothetically in the editing portion, but nowadays the mix engineer winds up doing a lot of that. Um, time alignment of vocals happens a lot. You know, it's like, oh yeah, you stack this hook, but those can be a little bit tighter using vocal line or something similar. I generally hope that I'm not tuning vocals in the mix. Um, I really would love if those would come to me already tuned. I really would love if y'all would send me your vocals already tuned. Um, but if something's out, then I might tighten it up. I That's something I would probably ask before I change the intonation on somebody's stuff. I might just send a message to the artist. Hey, this note in the bridge is a little bit under or whatever. Do you want me to touch it up? Um, but it's an interesting thing. Stuff like that. The time aligning and the tuning of vocals and all that kind of stuff. While it may not be the mixer's job, it makes your mix sound that much better. And that right. is the mixer's job. And that's the yeah. mixer's job. Yeah. So, you know, especially like with artists working at home, you may have a singer and they've got, you know, a decent mic and a decent pre and they get it in there and it's recorded clean or clean enough. But they may not really have the same skill level tuning vocals as I do because uh, I've been doing it for a very long time and I'm fast and I'm pretty good at tuning vocals. So, you know, I may charge them a little bit more for that, but it's like, let me tune these up for you. Let me make sure that these are right. Because, you know, you can A, B it. If you take a chorus that, you know, R&B chorus, it's stacked up six, seven, eight times or whatever, and it could be a great singer and everything's pretty close. And then you A, B that versus the tuned version. It's like night and day. 
because the clarity that you're getting out of the vocals is so much deeper because you're not having to listen through it through slight dissonance, right? So when everything is locked in pitch-wise, it feels a lot clearer. Timing-wise, it's a lot clearer. You're not getting this blurring from a stack of six voices almost in sync, right? And you can overdo it, and this is where the artistry and editing comes in. You know, digital editing is something that we all very much take for granted when you listen to a record. No one's like, ooh, that editing was clean. And that's how it should be. If they notice your edits, you didn't do it right. You know? But we know, and those of us on the inside, if you worked on the album and if you heard the roughs and then you heard the mix, it's like, yo, that shit is so crispy. How'd you do that? Well, it wasn't, it's not always an EQ thing. It's not always, where's the compressor? Sometimes you need to tighten the timing on stuff and it's gonna just open everything up for you. Things are gonna feel more present and clear and forward if they're actually time aligned. Just squashing something with a compressor, with a compressor doesn't always mean it's going to be more forward and present. It might be more forward, but still blurry because you haven't focused the timing on it, right? Um, so if you can get these things in quickly and do them fast, it goes such a long way for your mix and making everything just sound just is more crispy, right? You can overdo it. You can tune the life out of a vocal. Um, you know, everything that doesn't have to and shouldn't sound like Cher and T-Pain. I'm an old man. I don't really believe in auto-tuning your rap vocals, but <laughs> I'll save that argument for somebody else. You know, I mean, it, styles change and things change and techniques change, you know? Um, the lane of the world I work in, I don't really, we don't really do the hard tune thing on raps, but it's out there, so, you know. Um, but these are the kind of things, and I felt salty tuning vocals on a record I wasn't supposed to, but at the end of the day, it sounded better. And so... That's just, the job is expanded beyond, okay, push faders, patching this compressor, open up the top end, beef up the bottom, and there's the mix. It's different now. We have a lot. We have, we have, we have a little bit more to do. But all of these things are in service of the song. And that's the most important thing. And that's what we do as mix engineers is we unleash the potential of the song right it's all in there we got the tracks we've got the files maybe they're messy maybe they sound great we don't have to do a lot but knowing how much we need to do to make the song what it needs to be that's the job and that's sort of what you said at nam that really caught my attention um what you've described with the tuning and with the editing making it sound good those are sort of technical things if you took it all the way and made them technically perfect, but you're not doing that. You're stopping somewhere between technically perfect and uh, organic. And, and the word you use is you're going to give a, a listener a feeling. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah, because that's what music is for. If music doesn't give you any kind of feeling, if you're just like emotionally neutral when you hear it, somebody missed the mark somewhere because no one writes a song to have you not feel anything. Right. That's that, that, that that's 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 not what it's for. Um, so finding that in between part of, OK, this is all in tune, but it doesn't need to be just ruler flat because sometimes the right note is just a little over, just a little under. If you're doing some big move into the chorus, we're sweeping up. Maybe you want it just that little bit over, just to like, ah, then you break in, right? Like, that's tension. Tension and release. That's emotion, is tension and release. So we're trying to draw that out of the music. Sometimes, you know, I mean, blues music is all about the in-between notes. That's where the blues is. The blues is in between the notes. If you take, you know... Uh, any famous blues singer and you tune everything exactly to the grid, you just took all the blues out of it. You took all the vibe out of it, right? If you take an incredible jazz drummer and you quantize every single hit to be exactly on the grid, you just edited all of the feeling out of that performance. I don't want to listen to that. I don't want to listen to a quantized jazz drummer. I want to listen to quantized 
trap beats, sure, because those hi-hats need to be very accurate. But don't quantize my jazz. I'm not here for that. So this is where the art part comes into the editing. The art part comes into the decisions that, okay, enough is enough, or this is too much, or this is not enough. But all of that comes from serving the song. If you understand what the song is, then you'll know how much is enough. I love that. And that certainly comes from your time as a drummer and probably overplaying maybe at the beginning. Definitely. And then learning to serve the music. <laughs> yeah. It just lets, release right into what you do now. Yeah, because it's about the music, right? I don't want you to listen to my drums. I want you to listen to the song and sure, understand and recognize, all right, these drums are banging, but in context of the song, right? Like, I hate drum solos. Because everybody's grooving and everything's moving, then all of a sudden it's. It's fine if I'm going for the drum solo, the maybe, but like, I don't know, man. Give me the groove. I might have been tapping my foot. I might have been dancing. I might have been having a good time, and now I'm listening to your chops. Eh, no thanks. Yeah. You know, that's not, that's, that's not what I'm here to, to hear. So Billy Woods and Lucid, mm -hmm. you've worked with them time and time again. Yeah. What do you think it is about your work and you that keeps your clients coming back? I think, and I'm speaking for my clients, so hopefully they feel this way, uh, trust that I'm there to make their vision the best. Um, you know, when I mix, I do things and we all have our sound. Right? You and I could get the same exact files to mix, the same exact song, and your mix is going to sound one way and my mix is going to sound another way, because and that's the human part, right? Um, but as long as, us, as long as both of us are trying to mix for the sake of the song, then they're both good, valid mixes that you know are trying to move in that direction, and my clients know that about me. I'm not here to be like, well, it's a Willie Green mix, so I need to do this. And, you know, like, I know what I sound like. It, you know, well, it's, it's my mix. So I'm going to turn my drums up, and I'm going to add a lot of delays and effects, and I'm going to do that. So it's a Willie Green thing. It's like, no, that's just how I hear shit. That's just how I hear music. If there's an open space that we need to make more epic, I'm going to throw some delays on there, because that's how I get down, right? Like, that's, that's why you come to me, because theoretically, you like that shit. If you don't like that, then you don't hire me, and you know that's my thing to deal with. Um, you know, with Woods and Elucid, I mean, they both know by this point that I love their music. Like, I'm excited. Like, Woods is like, oh, I got a new album to mix. Yo, I'm ready. You know, uh, we've been talking about, I told Bessie for a while, Luce has been writing for a while, and he was like, yeah, I want to come and record it all with you. I'm like, yes, all right, bet. I'm sitting here, I'm like writing notes down on napkins, like, oh, maybe I'll try this compressor, maybe I'll try this vocal chain or whatever, because it's exciting, you know, and with them specifically, like, it's uh, there, there's always an energy at the beginning of a new project. Um, we all have clients who maybe their music is not our favorite. Because that's also, like, everything that comes through is not going to be your favorite and the biggest record of all time, right? There's also all the in-between stuff, and that's fine. Uh, and you find a way to enjoy it, but again, we're still headed for that make the song great. And so when your clients know that you're ready to do that, that's when they'll come back. You know, repeat clients, it's also, like, things like listening to them and listening to what they want, Right? Don't take mix notes personally if they ask you, hey, I really want this. You know, maybe say, oh, well, do you mind if I ask why? And make sure I understand how to get what you want or have a conversation. Um, but I learned the hard way because uh, we all make mistakes early in my career. My job is not to sit here and argue and fight with you about how I think the song should be mixed. Right? I may think, oof. Yeah, oh, you want the vocal that loud? I don't know. I really think, you know, and I can give my piece. But at the end of the day, that they're just like, nah, turn the vocal up. Our job is to turn the vocal up, right? Because their name is on the front of the artwork in very big letters. My name is somewhere on the inside and probably not even in the streaming credits if I just mixed it. Spotify, fix that. Um, you know what I mean? Like, it's not about me 
So, you know, I care. So, yeah, we'll talk about it. I really don't think you need more bass in here. It's going to be overload. It's dominating or whatever. But engineering is the service industry. You're serving somebody at a restaurant. If you're a waiter at a restaurant and they're like, yeah, I really want the monkfish today. Nobody at the table cares if you as the server don't like monkfish. Nobody cares. You're not eating the monkfish. It's your job to deliver that safely to the table and as delicious and tasty as that person might want it. Yeah. And create the experience that that person wants. Yes. Right? Yeah, You're like not the one at dinner for mixers. We're not the ones who are making our album. We're here facilitating somebody else's musical dream. And we do that in a way that's hopefully fulfilling to us. And hopefully we like how the end product turns out. But it ain't about us. We're not here to be like, well, Willie Green really likes his vocals like this. Nobody cares because they're listening to an Elucid album, not a Willie Green album. Walk us through the process of creating this album. I told Bessie, uh, what are some ways that you brought what they wanted to life in this particular mix? Even if we jump in the session. Elucid has released a lot of work over the last years, multiple Arm & Hammer projects, a bunch of uh, solo projects, but as far as like an official, like this is an official big Elucid full-length LP, uh, it's been a while since uh, his debut LP with Backwoods called Save Yourself, um, which I mixed, I think it was like back in 2016, I think. Um, and great album, but it's been like the labels talking about. All right, well, Lucid, we need we need the proper follow up to save yourself. And so this has kind of been in the works. But then the Arm and Hammer albums are coming out, and this and that, pandemic and Haram, all all this kind of stuff is like been leading up toward this. And so we kind of knew, yo, we can't really miss on this one. You know, labels waited, fans are waited. We've all been waiting. Like, all right, we got this. Like, we got to hit this one. Um, but it wasn't a pressure thing. It was more of a focus thing, right? Like when he's like, okay, I'm writing, I'm ready. We got the beats, I'm ready. You know, my job is, first off, as a recording engineer, just be ready to capture that. You know, I recorded a Lucid a lot over the years. I know he's not going to want to do a whole lot of takes. So the mic better be right when he walks in the door. Um, and just to follow his pace. Uh, the way that he works, he already knows what he wants it to sound like. The job is to get it here and to put him in a position where he can let that out, right? Make sure he's comfortable, comes in, lights a certain vibe or just whatever. I'm like, he's, he knows what he wants, but he's not like an uptight dude where he's going to walk and be like, well, this is, this is not dumb. You know, it's like, he's like, it's chill, but also he knows what he wants and he wants to get that. And I like that kind of artist because it's not a lot of, oh, no, and what is this? He's like, nah, let's do it again. No, let's do another take. No, that's the take. You know, and he knows when we get through the take, he knows that that's the one. A lot of this album was full takes straight through. Um, the song Old Magic is one take. One single take. And it's, it's just unbelievable vo vocal performance. And... You know, he just, he knows, he knows what it's supposed to be. And it's my job to be ready to have that, you know, because I'm a believer. If you come in to record vocals with me, you walk in the room, you could walk in the room, right into the booth, and I'm ready to hit record right then. Like the mic is checked, the headphones are checked. I've got a good but neutral starting spot on my vocal chain so I can adjust as necessary. I know I've got the headroom um, because it's a drag to be ready to perform on a mic and then the engineer is like oh wait hold on because i need to tweak the compressor settings you don't really care about the compressor settings i'm ready to rap right now why are you not ready right like yeah. and is the only way you come to that starting point just from maybe mistakes and experience and, and yeah over time? yeah you know because i i've had those nightmare sessions and thankfully not a ton but i've had the nightmare sessions where it's like everyone thought they were ready and it's like oh let me turn on the mic there's a buzz well, you got to get that buzz out of there. This is distracting. And I'm chasing a buzz for 15 minutes. Nothing kills a vibe worse than that. But I don't really know what's going on as the clock is ticking and someone, you know, someone, somewhere someone's recording budget is going through the roof because I can't figure out why this piece of gear is not working. 
that's the worst. Uh, and then, I'm, then I have to comp the time. Now I'm losing money. That's the worst, worst. You know what I mean? Now, now everybody's losing out. And there's no time for that. You know, the engineer needs to be invisible and facilitate the session moving, mo- mo- moving properly and smoothly and seamlessly. The artist can show up late. It's annoying, but the artist can show up late. The artist can be like, oh, we go- oh I, gotta- I have to do, you know, another take of this. Next thing you know, it's an hour later, we're still doing takes. Artists can do that. The producer can be super nitpicky. Oh, we'll do this, this, and that. Producer can do that. Engineer can't be holding up the session like that. Our job is to not hold up the session. You know, if I need to move a mic or say, hey, you know, I don't love this mic on your vocal. I'm going to swap that out and I'm going to put another one up. Sure. Just do that shit fast. You know, have your mic cabinet organized so you can go grab the mic that you need real quick and make that swap. You know, whatever it needs to do Whatever you need to do to quickly facilitate something, that's the job, right? So I'm starting there. And then, you know, other things. Yo, send me the beats that you want to work on ahead of time. So I've already got them the day before. I've got them downloaded. I've got them imported into Cubase. I've got them in the session. I've got the grid lined up there. You know, if I can tell by the nature of the beat, I might have some markers dropped. Like, oh, this is clearly the hook. We'll drop that marker. So no one has to... I want it to look like magic when the artist comes in. It's like, oh, you ready? Oh, you got everything? Oh, okay. Oh, I'm good. The artist is going to be excited because I clearly give a shit about their project. And then my job is easy. I hit record and I chill because I already did the work before. You know, I don't want to scramble in front of somebody. I'll scramble yesterday It'd be like, oh, this is buzzing. Oh, what sample rate is this? Oh, okay, well, this is not locked to a grid. Now I got to do this. I don't want to see anybody. I don't want to see me doing that stuff. I just want you to see me looking good. Yep. Right? Yep. And then as far as they know, I always look good. Right. It's right? like editing. The unnoticeable things yeah. are the best. The hard work comes when nobody's watching. Because that's when the discipline comes in. No, let me take the extra five minutes to properly line this up or whatever. That's all that, all that stuff. Because also when you get all that stuff out of the way early on and when you record properly and you're not clipping or things, you know, X, Y, and Z, then the mixing part is just fun and it's just artistic, right? You've taken all of the tedious stuff out of there and now you're just making music because you did all the stuff before. So the prep is all very important to me. And then a Luther can just come in and just be comfy, right? So when we first came in, most of the beats on I Told Bessie uh, are, were two tracks. Um, it's unfortunately the way that a lot of the hip hop industry is now. People send you the beat, and to record, generally it's a two track. People don't always send you all the stems or all the multis to record to. Hopefully you can get those later on, but nowadays people are like, no, that's how I want the beat to sound. Like, yeah, man, but my job is to make that thing sound good. But you can't tell producers, yeah, your beats don't sound good enough. Don't, you can't do that. You know, this one came in sounding pretty good. There was just some work I had to do to it. This track is uh, produced by Seb Bash, and the beat is just ridiculous. So this is a song called Bunny Chow off of I Told Bessie. Uh, this is my current favorite one, so that's why I had to pull it up for you. Because this, this is the one that's been in my head. Uh, I was walking around Nam all week, and the hook for this is just what's in my head. So I'm like, i got to do this one because I have to hear the song just to let that repeat out of me. Uh, so this is Bunny Chow, and it's just, you know, it's, I don't know, hard-hitting, and it's just an ill record. So... Um, you know, tracking we get in, and you can see right here on the screen cap, you, it's, I did a little cleaning because you got to clean things up and you got to, you know, make it clear. So I took out just any unnecessary, any unnecessary gaps there. But this is one take. So I'll lead 102. This is the second take. And I think we punched this part, and maybe I did a little bit of editing here. Um... Most things, like this is one take straight through, and then we did some overdubs in hip-hop. There's a couple different names for it. I just call them dubs, and that's where you'll layer 
certain words, certain lines here and there, just for some emphasis. And then this one particularly, he layered the whole chorus, which is right. Oh, no, lied. Half of the chorus, which is right here. Um, and I use that kind of in and out layering musically during mixing, but we'll take a look at that in a second. Uh, but this is just vocal straight through, and then we did some some layers. For each song, I sent him the individual vocal files. Elucid is very influenced by Jamaican dub music, which is a big precursor to hip hop as a whole. Hip hop was invented in the Bronx, but was invented by Jamaicans. DJ Cool Herc, who invented and coined the phrase, phrase hip hop, was Jamaican. And a lot of hip hop culture comes from the Jamaican sound clash culture with these big sound systems, these huge things that would have these battles, and they would do that on the block in the Bronx. You have a block party, one end of the block is one team's sound system, other end of the block is the other team's sound system, and who could get the speakers louder, who could make the beats bang more. That was a big part of that. Um, but also, all these delays and these, you know, like textures. all the textures and like long delays, um, you know, Lee Scratch Perry was legendary for that kind of stuff. Big delays has become a big part of my sound, it's a big part of a lucid sound. So for his records, I sent him the vocals back after he recorded them and after I cleaned them up because he processes them and adds some of his own long delays and sometimes some pitch, sh uh, pitch shifting stuff. And he sends that back to me and I might do more, I'll blend that in. So a lot of the vocal processing is kind of a team effort for me and a lucid. Um, so this track here that just says dub, this is him just, you know, I can solo, let's see what this is. You know, so that came from the lead vocal. Half-hearted, hello, 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 oh, it's time to jack. And then he adds, Half hearted, hello, 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 oh, it's time to jack. And in context, Half hearted, hello, 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 oh, it's time to jack. I bet on my. Right? It's subtle and it's in there, but there's like with that, because that's a special line. And it's not even like he's saying something, because all of that, some of that is a sound, not necessarily words. Elucid has really started to master. Just the the use of his voice, not just lyrically, but the voice itself and the sound as an instrument, right? Uh, people think rap, well, it's like talking, but it, but rhyming. It's like nah, there's so much pitch and so much inflection, and so much tone that goes into rapping. That's all. That's like the that's like the spice that's in there. It's not as just you know if you're just saying things that rhyme, you're Dr. Seuss. If you're saying things that rhyme on rhythm, it's still not all the way to the artistry. Of its right, you know, because yeah. we could do that, and you know, like, yeah, I, I was gonna give a bad example, but then that would get clipped on the on the internet of me doing a whack rhyme, and I won't do that because I cannot rap, and no one ever needs to hear it. You know, so really, a lot of this was thinking about treating a lucid's voice as an instrument, not just a vehicle for lyrics, which it also is, and he's a supreme ly a supreme lyricist. But we got to think about sounds here too. We got to think about textures. We got to think about how we're doing that. So we're pitch shifting stuff. When we get into the chorus, I'm also doing some of that. So that's that's the dub layer that's on this chorus. You know, let's do this right way. Let's listen to the piece of this chorus, and then we'll kind of look at the different parts because. He's adding his pitch shifting, so I'm not necessarily pitch shifting everything, but maybe I'm pitch shifting effects to match the tonality, and let's take a listen. So you hear the little, you, so you start, so you hear the effects trails. So I'm taking that dub track. So as part of my template in every mix, I have certain effects that are always set up. I know I'm going to use a reverb, 
a few delays, like a slap delay, an eighth note, and a quarter note delay. Or those are things I'm going to probably go to in every mix. And I don't like to, like, I just keep my template and I'm going to set them up every time. Wasting time. But on this eighth note delay, standard eighth note, and so we're using some Echo Boy here, saturating a bit, and we've got an FM radio kind of preset on it, and a little bit of feedback, and that's cool. But that's you know for the chorus, I need a little extra, little extra flavor. To let you know, okay, this is a very special part of, uh, part of this. So I'm taking little Alter Boy, and I am detuning the formant. And driving that because if I can do something, I might as well distort it. It's my general philosophy. And then blending a little bit of that in. So on the delay return, right? So that's just the delay return. But now we're getting into some aggressive textures. We're hitting some of the pitch shift, and then we're hearing other parts of the song. And I'm trying to take cues off of whatever, what else is happening in the record to make my decisions as far as like what's an appropriate effect. Because I've got, I mean, not even a flex, but I've got a long plug-in list. You know what I mean? Like there's a lot of stuff in here. Like this is just my delay folder. You know, like how do you, how do you decide which delay is the one? Well, I've got stuff I go to for sure. But I also, do I need like a clean, like very clear delay here? Do I need something that's got some grime to it? And then the grime one, like this, the decent amount of saturation on the sound toys, but it's like, and eh, that's not enough. So let's do some more because, you know. And that's something that gets back to the dub, right? The, the origin. That, yes. That grime. That yeah, I'm taking, stuff. right, because those were tape delays. So you have certain tape saturation that's on there. They may not be super clean depending on the tape. Like I've got uh, a uh, Echoplex in here. Um, I didn't use on this because it's actually very dirty and noisy right now. I got to take it to the shop. Um, it was just too noisy. It was like one notch less noisy. I would have been using it, but it was just, you know, um, but I don't just want, I don't want the same thing that everybody else could do because then you can, any, anybody can mix that record. I want to bring something to the table and I want to make sure, but I want to make sure musically that we're, we're in there, right? So we listen to the beat. You know, there's like an affected vocal sample back in there. You know, it's a lot of, it's basically drums and a little bit of other stuff. So there's space to do things, but this is a grimy song. It's kind of got, got a grimy beat to it. So my job here is not to make everything pristine, but to meet that griminess where it's at. Because first, I know that's where Lucid wants to be at. And if Lucid wants to be there, and the production wants to be there, um, that's where my mix needs to be. If not, I'm mixing the wrong song. Or I'm mixing it the wrong way, right? So I need to approach that. Uh, but sometimes there is too much noise. So real quick, I want to actually show the original beat. Um, and then some of the stuff I did to it because I really like this beat, but it needed a little bit of help. Let's go back to the top. So again, this is produced by Seb Bash. Um, and it was delivered to you as a, in a stereo format. Like this. Stereo format, yeah. So when I say I got a lot of two-track beats, that's what I mean is that whoever made the beat, they made it. They printed just two-track, hopefully wave. Um, and then that's it. And there are some producers like, no, that, that's the beat. Go ahead. And I'm like, yeah, but if you separated that, and if you had that, I'd have a lot more control. Um, but you don't always get that control. And so a lot of what we do as mixing is also problem solving. How do we get the best out of this musically and keep it sounding natural and right for the song, but also get in there and do the shit that we need to do to make it right, right? So this is the beat, how it came in. So that's a dope beat. And I like the weird little vocal, vocal chop in there. I didn't listen. I didn't listen. Like that kind of 
you know, that probably set up a lucid a certain way to rhyme a certain way. Like, I didn't listen. What didn't you, you know, whatever. But I exist in a world of indie hip hop where we're not necessarily here to have everything be super clean and super crispy. And I told that line where I like a clear mix, but I'm fine with the grime in there because that grime kind of lets you know what the real clear parts are because that contrast. But that's too much noise in the top end for me. It's too much noise in the top end. And then, you know, as I mix, so as we're listening now, Cubase has what's called a listen bus. So we're listening just to the track, not through it going through my mix bus and through everything else I did downstream. Um, so this is just the beat. But I'm going to take that. It's going to be compressed along the way. Things are going to happen. And then it's going to be mastered. All that noise is going to come up and up and up. That noise flare is going to come up every time you squash the dynamics and then bring it up. That noise flare comes with it. And so I know off the jump, okay, I have to reduce some of this so it doesn't overwhelm when we get down there. But it's not as simple as saying, oh, well, let me just throw a low pass filter on that because the hi hats are a big part of this or a big part of this groove, right? There's a lot going in there. So what I did, yeah, and throwing a uh, low pass filter on would, for those of you who aren't catching on, would would take out everything, everything, not just the right? Yeah. That's the trick with these two tracks is that what you do to one thing, you do to everything. If you want to control the kick drum, you're also affecting the bass. If you want to pull the snare out a little bit, well, if there's a piano sample in there, you might have some piano notes that are in that same frequency range. Um, so for a lot of stuff like this, if I just want to turn down these hi-hats, for instance, I will go to something like uh, Eventide Split EQ, and I would open that up and... I can use this to turn down the high transients and I'm softening those hi-hats. Wow. Uh, or if I need to pull those out. So that's pretty powerful if I want, you know, when you can really get in, you know, if I want to... Let's see if I can find... Like that, which I, I I love that set. I want them boosting that to drive that a little more to get in, to get that in the mix a little more. Um, so that all works great for that. But the the noise reduction is a bigger challenge here. So because I can't just yes, I can boost. Let me go back. I can boost the hi hats or reduce the hi hats. And you would think conversely, I can take the tonal side, which is the opposite of the transient side, and try to move over that. However, the noise is pretty full range on this song. It's not enough just to reduce the highs. You know, I could probably take that and I could probably get away with, yeah, you know, it's not take all that up but the thing with the noise is that the noise is killing my detail across the full frequency spectrum of the entire beat like we hear the noise it's up top because there's more going on down in there but you know further down around 1k where like my snare crack is there's noise there too like, my, like all the clarity through the whole frequency range is is removed, right? So what I'm doing now to do a little more surgery to reduce this noise is I'm using spectral layers, which is very similar to Isotope RX. Um, it's a it's a spectral editor, um, but what I'm doing, what's really dope about uh, spectral layers is I can split the signal. So this is a spectral representation of how this beat looks. Like if we go back to the top, 
This is, right here you see the waveform, this is just a different representation. Right, so the different intensity, it's vertically, it's frequency, left to right is horizontal, but then the more intense the color, the louder the, uh, the, 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 louder the, the signal at that point. So here, like it starts with the snare, click, boom, 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 cat, boom. Boom, right? So, cat, boom, 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 cat, boom, right? So you can see the kicks down here. You can see the snares, the hi-hats here. But for a pretty open beat, there's a whole lot of stuff in that in between, right? That's the noise. Uh, but what Speculators lets me do is I can go to Unmix Components. And similar to how um split eq was working i won't say similar technology because i'm not a programmer and i'm sure they've done things differently i don't want anyone thinking that it's the same exact process but what spectrolayers is doing here is it's going to split out it's gonna split the signal into three parts the transient the tonal part but what uh, spectrolayers can also do is noise what doesn't fit cleanly into tonal or transient but what does generally wind up being you know just hiss and that kind of stuff it's a ai process machine learning or artificial intelligence or terminators coming to get us however you look at you know ai in that way um it's fun now before they take over yeah the it's world fun world. now yeah. until until <laughs> sky Sorry, future people yeah, yeah for everybody who's hiding from skynet we apologize right now it's pretty good though um but so here it's split up so the tonal is in pink so this is just the tonal information wow. right so it's just the transient which alone Kinda sounds like drums, but not really. But then we have also is the noise. So some of this is usable information. So I don't want to just mute all of that. Because without the noise, it sounds like this. Now, that's, it sounds like music, but that's not. That's not what it was before minus the noise. You exa exactly, the artifacts there. If I send that back to Seb Bash, she'd be like, you know, what did you do to my beat? All the stuff is out of there. But what I may want to do is I can maybe lower the noise a little bit or maybe I want to EQ just the noise part and leave the rest. So what actually wound up happening, once I split these three things in spectral layers, I can take them and drag them each separate part to a track. I split it out and we have the tonal, the transient, and the noise aspects of the beat. So I, now I disable the track with the original two track, but now I got a little more control. You know, this is an extreme process for a beat that was pretty noisy. Uh, if I just wanted to just control the hi-hat to bring a little more snare attack out or fix some boominess in the low mids, I would use like the split EQ and make it simpler. Um, but now we've got the tonal. The transient. We got that noise that's different than what we just heard so i'm taking these three elements this is what i'm mixing so if we go over to our mixer on our tonal side i've got console one which is kind of where i start all of my mixes uh it's it's a channel strip for those who aren't familiar um and i'll say off the top i don't want to make this too much about what plugins i use because the techniques that i use should translate, except for like super specific tools like spectral layers or, or split EQ. I'm a big believer in that 
a great mix engineer should be able to mix on any DAW with stock plugins and should be able to make a good mix, right? I have tons of stuff that I prefer, mm. but if I'm only beholden to my tools to make a good mix, am I mixing it or are the tools mixing it? I need to be able to do that, open up Pro Tools, which I rarely use. I'm a Cubase user. Use the DigiRack plugins, which I'm are some pretty basic plugins. I should be able to do a good mix because I understand musically, you know, it has the normal stuff. It's got faders and pan pots. I can get my balance and I can get my spacing in. I can do that. And then I can shape with whatever I have. I, sh I should be able to do that. But I'm comfier when I've got all my, when I've got all my tools, right? Um, so I'm using uh, SoftTube uh, and the console one. This is my channel strip. I got a little bit of a high cut, cleaning out a little bit in that mid range. Right, like let's, this is just tonal. So if I bypass the EQ. So I'm just doing a little bit of a dip here for clarity in the low mids and also a lucid very much is important to him that his voice is present and full and very in, full and warm, right? I'm leaving some space for his vocal to take those frequencies. I don't want to boost him there because that may make him sound muddy. But if the track is a little thinner there by comparison, he's going to feel more full, right? Mixing is all about contrast. If the beat is real loud, there's no way the vocal can feel real loud because the beat's using up all the loud, right? There's only so much headroom, so it's all, it's a puzzle piece. It's all matter of interplay. Uh, so I'm notching a bit at 437. Uh, not even notching. That's that's a wide a wide bandwidth. I want to consider notching. Just pushing back to let him sit through there. This high this high uh, filter. That whistly stuff. Those whistle tones. I don't want that. Look at that. Get it out of here. You know, just to ease that off a little bit. Um, I got rocks in my head. I didn't listen right. Rattling it round. Fuck what they said. Now he won't miss right. the light. So I'm going to bypass the EQ for a second when he comes in because I want to hear how that crowds his voice there. I got rocks in my head. I didn't listen right. Rattling it round. Fuck what they said. Now he won't miss the light. Shifting gears more than aware. I've been much. It's subtle. But Elusive is an artist, he's like, yo, put my vocals right up front. For the first couple records that we did, the only mixed notes that I was getting was, yo, know, vocals louder, vocals louder. And so I got in that groove, it's like, okay, I would generally put the vocal here, so let me go up another dB or another half a dB or whatever. I know that's what he's gonna want. And that's like the nice thing about mixing an album is you get into that rhythm of, I know what the artist wants. Um, and then that being said, the hardest songs on the album to mix are the first couple because you're still getting into, like, I've mixed hundreds of songs for Lucid at this point. But what is, where does he want his vocals today? In the 2022 iteration of Lucid, where does he want his vocals? Where does he want his drums to sit? On solo record Lucid rather than Arm and Hammer duo record Lucid what's different because it's not it's not necessarily the same i've seen people on twitter talk and they're like oh well there's a lot of billy woods features on here this is just like another arm and hammer album it is absolutely not that because when it's arm and hammer they make diff they make choices themselves they make decisions that suit both of them when it's a lucid it's just like nah this is what i want right um and that's an important distinction to make when you're dealing with the artist because Woods likes things one way and they compromise. Here, there's no compromises. So Lucy's just like, yo, get them vocals up. Get them right out front. Then along with that, a little multi-band distortion because um, why not distort? What frequency is this at? So this is, oh yeah, okay. I know why I did this. I got rocks. So without, those muffled vocal samples in the back, I wanted to 
tear those a little bit. I want those to be a little bit distorted. They come in intermittently, so it's hard to, you know, let me see if I can go back to the first marker. <laughs> No, like that. I wanted those. See here, you can see, it's hard because it's a weird way to listen. They don't have that quite bite to them. They don't have that little bit of edge. And I wanted that edge because even though they're unintelligible vocals, that's kind of one of the key musical elements of the beat. Right? If we just come back to the beat, if we just saw the instrumental. So you get drums, so it's kick, snare. Snare's really a rim click, hi-hat. That's the main drum pattern, right? There's bass, there's bass in there. that hit with the delay and eh, eh. so we got that and then there's two sets of vocal samples there's the clean one i didn't listen and it's funny because you, no one would ever know this unless they saw the session but that's what the beat is called i didn't listen um naming beats is always the hardest thing in the world for me because i no one may ever know later on. So I'm sitting there like, what am I going to call this beat? It doesn't really matter, but I had to name it something so I know what it what it was, but it's not the name of the song, you know, all this kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, the beat is actually, is actually called that. Um, I don't want to lose that. And then there's this muffled one. But to me, because apart from that hit and the bass, the only other harmonic content in the beat is that distorted that muffled sample i didn't listen it comes in and out but that's not i don't consider that harmonic in that same way so i wanted to really emphasize that part of the beat because that's where the music part is it's almost like a piano or a guitar like comping chords right? exactly because why you know, and this is the thing about working with sampled music, and this is where you kind of unlock how to deal with samples. You know, that's a sample of a voice, but we don't need another voice here. Lucy's going to rap on this. So we can warp it, we can distort it, we can just turn it into a sound. Now we're just mixing a sound, we're not thinking about mixing a vocal, right? If I've got a sample, maybe it has a harp in it, I don't want it, I may not want it to sound like a harp, I may want it to sound like... I don't know, a bomb going off or something. Like, who knows? Like, I want to be able to take sound and have complete control to flex it and turn it into something different or just make it a beautiful heart. But I want the option. And that's when you're really pushing the limit on samples where it's not like, okay, I'm going to take the guitar line from this song and the drums from this James Brown song and the bass from this Sly Stone song. I'm going to put it together. I'm going to have a hit. And shit, you might because you just sampled James Brown and Sly and the Family Stone and Johnny Guitar Watson, all the people who had hits before. Yeah, okay, you did that. Awesome. Great job. Maybe it's a great beat. Are you reinventing the wheel? Well, it depends on how you use those sounds. If you flip them, if you stretch them, if you process them, if you turn it into a different thing, then you're pushing boundaries. And not that every song has to push boundaries, but if I'm making a record, I want to push somebody's boundary. I want to get somewhere. I want to get loose to where someone's like, yo, I never heard that in that way before. That's when I feel good about it. I was like, all right, I gave you something different. I gave you something new, something to think about and a reason to come back to my record and not somebody else's. If you want to hear what everybody else did, go listen to everybody else's music. I'm not here for that. That's not what I want to do. So I wanted to push this. So a little bit of fuzz, a little bit of dirt on that vocal sample. So this is between 2.5K and like almost 800 hertz, just in that like, mid mid range I wanted to push that there and then just a little multi-band compression just a little bit of control on the bottom end um, just to kind of get that to sit down in there right um, so that's just on the tonal part so let's get these drums in here
you know, we're hearing this still a little bit of artifact stuff from the noise reduction. But any noise reduction to the degree that we had to do, that we have to do on this song, you're going to get part of that. And a lot of things, whether it's tune, any, anytime you're in the editing realm, tuning, noise reduction, time correction, any of that stuff, you're basically dealing with a threshold of are these artifacts going to kill the music? Anytime you're editing, you're creating some kind of artifact. If you're slicing and like nudging a word, there's no audible artifacts, but you made a change. If you're using heavy vocal tuning, you're going to eventually hear the artifacts if you had to tune something very dramatically. And the back and forth that we deal with is, all right, I can live with that, or I this now sounds like ass and I had to do something else, right? Um, and this sounds better once we get the noise back in because we haven't reintroduced the noise yet. So here, again, we're on console one, taking a tiny little bit off that top, those hi-hats, and then a little bit of drive, a little bit of saturation on there because that's the kind of person that I am. You know, if we take off that EQ, try to get a little... All right, so we're getting there. It's not perfect yet. I'm using Soothe. Yeah, to start getting a little bit of that high stuff off of those hi-hats that we didn't like, you know. Here we're getting a little bit more of that kind of watery thing. So cutting that a bit. And then because a little bit of saturation is not enough, we also need decapitator. Just enough of that aggression because, you know, this is an aggressive song. You know what I mean? This is not a gentle ballad. That's not what we're here for. And then, to finish it off, let's bring in this noise. So now those artifacts aren't feeling so much that kind of watery thing because we're missing pieces. Those little things kind of connect to something else in the fabric of this three-layer thing that we have here. But now we can actually address the noise as its own entity. And it hasn't gone through all of these stages that the transients and tonal elements have. Right. So all we're doing with the noise is we're cutting out a lot of the bottom. Let's solo the noise for a second. So this is just that noise track. And I've got a high pass filter. So in that transient track, you could hear sometimes you would get a little bit of thumps coming through and that kind of thing. And I could spend a lot more time taking those out of the transient track and putting them in the tonal. I knew I was combining them back, so I wasn't as concerned about that. Um, but what I don't want is just complete chaos with noise across the bottom. So. You know, we can do that, and then I'll turn off the EQ. So you can hear everywhere, just imagine all those <laughs> There is a tick from a hi-hat that we're not hearing that's like right before that, right? And so we're just hearing the breath coming off that, and we know that the beat sounds weird if we take all of the noise out which is why I did it this way. Because at first I started, I just muted it. I put RX on it and all kinds of stuff I went through and I was like, this is, this is what's working the best for me. There's a, that's the thing with audio. There's a zillion ways to do things. You might approach this problem in a completely different way and come up with a solution that sounds different or better or exactly the same, but effective. And that's dope. And that's the way that you would do it. This is the way that I happen to do it. I might do it a different way tomorrow. But that's the fun part about audio. There's a million ways to do it. What's the best way to do that thing today for this piece of art? That's the way to do it. You know? And so that's what gets me bugged out on the internet. People are like, here is how you mix a vocal. You use this plugin and this thing. It's like, yo, but 
I'm going to be working with a different vocalist. Maybe I don't have that plugin. Maybe I don't like that plugin. Am I all of a sudden not making good music? Nah, I'm gonna do my thing my way and just make it sound good to me. And if my artists like it and if they fans like it, I did it the right way, you know? Um, so here, let's get that out of there a little bit. That's banging to me. And we've reduced now just for demonstration purposes. Let's bring you back. Original beat. Versus. Because all that noise in there, we could have put the record out with that noise in there. And indie rap fans would not have cared. They'd be like, yeah, that's just the texture in there. And it's probably true. Like, if there's samples, I don't take out record noise. You know, I know producers who add more record noise in if there wasn't enough in the sample. Um, and there's part of that. And some of it's that texture. I just want to be able to have control over. And I want to be able to decide, yeah, I like that noise and we didn't take it all the way out. But we got to chill it out a little bit because at some point it's going to kill the definition of everything else around it. It gets back to that space game that you were playing with. Yeah. 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 Right. Now you can shape the noise and create space. And the punch comes through so much more. Exactly. Right? Because it's not just this low-key wall of acoustic energy of sound that is taking away from the clarity of everything else, right? It just by default existing there is filling in all of the little holes of clarity that we've created through combining the other instruments and everything. It's just this kind of blanket behind there. So nothing can sound as clear as it might because... It's just this shh, just in the background. And you won't necessarily notice it. You won't miss it. But if it comes back and we were able to A-B this like on the record, people would be like, yo, now all of a sudden there's all this noise. Nothing feels as crispy, right? So just a little, and you know, and taking a little bit out, it's not that much quieter, you know? If... I got rocks in my head, I did it, listen right, rather than Like right now, I would put it right about there. I'm actually curious just to see. Uh, shout out to Mixer History, uh, Undo on Cubase. That's where I just put it right now. Ah, pretty close. I, this is at minus 6.57 in the mix that went on the record. It was at minus 6.2. So today, I guess I'm feeling a little less noisy than I was when I mixed this on April 18th. Mixed it on April 18th. I was feeling a little more noisy that day. You know, and this, this, this is kind of the human part. Also, that 0.3 dB, nobody gives a shit about. So it's not like I was wrong before or right now or whatever. Nobody knows. Nobody cares. Uh, but it is, to me, I, I think that's an interesting exercise. If I were to go back and take mixes... Faders down and just rebalance them without thinking about where I put it before. How close would I get? I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I'm self-confident enough to do that because I might go back like, I hate all my mixes because all my balances were off. But I think it's an interesting thing to do because uh, apparently, yeah, that's where I feel the noise level on this record is at. So you use a lot of saturation. Up to this point, you've been talking about using it as an effect or to add textures. But at the NAM conference, you mentioned something about using saturation to help bring out the bass when playing back on bass challenged systems, like a, like a phone or something. Yeah, you know, fact of the matter is we're in a studio. I've got all these lovely speakers. Most people are not listening on this. Most people are listening on this. 
and I make bass heavy music, the bass is a big part of it. I can't go out there with my beats not knocking and just be like, well, it's on an iPhone, so you go and get, no, you still gotta get these kicks, right? If you use saturation on low frequency instrument, well, no, let me start over. If you use saturation on anything, what you're doing is you're adding harmonics. The human ear is real smart and it will pick up on things and it'll hear that. So if your fundamental frequency, and that's something that maybe your phone can't reproduce or your earbuds, or whatever doesn't reproduce, by saturating, you're adding harmonics on top of that and the ear can hear the harmonics and fill in the information. Well, these are the harmonics. The, f the fundamental is here. And it lets us hear and understand what the bass is, even if the speaker cannot reproduce that fundamental frequency. So if you've got a sine wave bass, you know, and you got that thing low and you are rattling the subs and you know when they play this in the Jeeps, it's going to rattle, it's going to shake the highway, everyone's going to know you're coming. Okay, that's awesome. Your iPhone's never going to reproduce that. But if you add some saturation, it's going to give you some 120. It's going to give you some 240. It's going to give you some 480. Your phone can reproduce those, and those are just the multiples that I did off regular math in my head. It's probably not those frequencies, but it's going to give you those higher things that your phone can reproduce. And then I go back and I listen on the full range system, and now I'm thinking, okay, is this changing my bass sound drastically, or is it just kind of thickening it? because I may not want to change it drastically. Maybe I like the bass sound, I just need to make sure, okay, it's gonna do that. So what I may do is, you know, drive it a little bit more to the point where I'm hearing it, and then roll it back just that one little bit. Um, or what I might even do is I might duplicate my bass track and then have a distorted bass track and crush that and then bring that fader down and blend that in. You know, you can do this with a wet, no with, with a wet dry knob as well, obviously. Uh, most saturation plugins now have a mix knob. Um, the trick with doing it on another fader is you can then EQ that distorted bass. You can compress that distorted. You, you can further affect it in ways that you can't if it were just one plugin on your track with the wet dry. You can't do further processing to that. So whatever you need. If you, you know, I generally, I would start with the wet dry. For instance, like I'm doing with the transients here, you know, this, why does that? Obviously this is giving some drive up top to my snare, to the hi-hats a little bit, round off the edges a little bit on those, but also aggression to the bass, right? Like let's, Just a little bit of edge there. And in context, you hear it more because I want the punch of the kick drum to come out, right? The thud and the beef of the kick drum because of the kind of sound that actually all resides in the tonal side, um, just for how it's separated, right? Just a little bit of grime. I don't know. To me, and it's pretty subtle because, you know, I mix, it's only like 25% of that. Like, I'm not doing. That's a lot, you know? Just enough that when that's on a bass challenge system, it's still gonna punch through. It's still gonna bang down there. At least it's never gonna sound like a full range system. But unfortunately, most people are actually probably listening on a bass challenge system. And this is where they're used to getting their music, but your regular laptop speakers, I don't care how nice your laptop is, it's not gonna bang as much as a full range speaker is. But we have to make sure that we hit those people as well as people who do have. It's also why it's important I've got big speakers here, 
but I always listen also on a small, like the Aventone Mix Cube, or it's based on the old Oratone 5C, I think it was a 5C. Um, it's like a very small, lo-fi speaker, you know? And if your low end is translating down there, it's going to translate up here on the bigger ones. If I can hear that bottom end on my earbuds, you know it's going to be right in the Jeep, right? Um, it's kind of like mixing bass for the lowest common denominator, I guess. And it's important to listen to both because what you don't want to do is just crank the bass so you can hear it over there and then you go back to a full range system and the bass is overloading everything and it's dominating your mix because there is very much something as too much bass. We're not looking for just all the bass in the world, but the bass that we do want, and we may want a lot of it, but it needs to be present, it needs to be solid, it needs to be full, and it needs to work on whatever speaker it's coming out of, right? Trans making the music translate wherever you go is a big part of our job. It's cool if it sounds great here, but unless everybody's gonna come through to listen to the album and sit here next to me, I need to make sure it sounds good everywhere else. So I'm listening on a small speaker. I'm going to listen on my phone. I'm going to listen on headphones. I'm going to listen to my car wherever I go. And if you're only going to listen to one place, my recommendation is wherever you go to listen to music you're not working on, listen to it there. That's where you hear music. You're used to hearing music there, so you're going to know if something's wrong if it doesn't sound like the rest of the records you listen to there. Yeah, the key musical components need to be compatible with whichever mm -hmm. playback system yeah. will be used. Because if not, you're missing the song. You know, if I do a special effect moment where it goes everything like, I don't know, some huge big super low sub thing, well, everybody can't get the special effects. That's why it's special. You know, I don't know. You know, like everything won't be able to translate, but the key musical elements will have to. That's the job. That's one thing I noticed about this album. In a second, I want you to tell people where they can listen to it. Mm -hmm. But I've listened to it several times, of course. Um, and it's one of those albums. If, if you've only listened to it on these headphones, listen to it on your other headphones. If you've only listened mm. to it in headphones, listen to it on speakers because there's little nuggets, little treasures to be yeah, found. Yeah, that's that replay value. That's like, okay, you know, I put it on while I'm doing dishes and I, I got my big Bluetooth speaker and it's banging and it's cool. But then I put it on in headphones and I'm like, oh, but the panning on the sides and this, and he's doing phase stuff to put effects behind you and stuff like that. Like, I like to put in shit for the people who take the time to listen in headphones, right? Or people who take the time to listen on a hi-fi system or whatever. Like, you're going to get these raps, you're going to get these beats regardless. But if you really want to sit down, like, I want to hear it. We got that in there for you, right? We got we got the spice in there for you because that's the fun part. That's why you listen to songs more than once. If you get everything from a song on the first listen, why go back? I mean, sure, if it just really makes you happy, sure. But from like an artistic standpoint, I want you to catch something new every time you hear it uh, because that's that for me that's where the interest is like there need to be multiple layers to it and like i know elucid is writing with multiple layers you know it's like i'm talking about like with billy woods but the whole backwards roster everybody it's like you listen and you go back you listen five years later and it's like i'm at a different point in my life i get that now that's what's exciting to me like the first time i heard snoop dogg i didn't get it because i was 10 and so I age myself in front of everybody on YouTube. Uh, you know, but, but like I heard it and I'm like, well, is this, I don't know. Like, you know, cause I was a 10 year old like East Coast kid, you know? And I'm like, oh, this just sounds real funky and like a weird West Coast way. And I didn't understand the nuances behind like it was because it was all based out of Parliament Funkadelic. All the early Dog Pound stuff or the early Death Row stuff really the chronic, doggy style, all of that has a very direct lineage to Parliament Funkadelic and not just in the samples, obviously, you know, Atomic Dog, we sampled that, became What's My Name and, you know, the heavy sampling, but some of the nuances and little things like the illest thing with Dr. Dre on those records 
is that he would take a two bar loop and keep you captivated for four minutes. But at three minutes and 15 seconds, there would just be like a super funky but simple bass fill. So something would just somebody would just play something different and put a little thing on there. And you're like, oh shit, what was that? That was like a real funky moment. This is a cassette. I need to rewind to the beginning of the song and go back and listen again. But now it's like, oh, I want to stream it again. Or, yo, something just happened. Someone's really paying attention and the nuance is there. That at three minutes and 14 seconds, they did something new and they put in some fly shit for me to catch. I want to get all those. I want the Easter eggs. It's like a Marvel movie. Give me all the Easter eggs. Where's the reference to, to Iron Man? Where's the reference to so-and-so, to She-Hulk? No, give me that stuff, right? I want the pieces to come together. It's rewarding as a listener when you put on the headphones and you're like, oh, this is different. This is a teleportation thing because we all have these memories. Like as a kid, you sit down, like the first time you listen to an album in headphones and you're not missing anything from the rest of your environment around you, you take the environment out of the equation and I'm just giving you all the stuff right there for you to catch it in these headphones. And it's like all the background stuff. Like that's where the detail, all the details were in there, all the movement and all that stuff. It's 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 crazy. It's crazy. And it's an exciting thing. And well, I can tell you're excited about it as a listener, but you're doing it. You're doing it as an engineer because I heard it. You yeah. Know, you, you didn't coach me to say that. That's that's what I know. I I appreciate that because that's the shit I want to put in the record. I want to put in the stuff that when you go and look in the special features and you see the details and you heard it, I'm doing that shit. For y'all, I, I want that because that's that's the exciting part. You go and get the rhymes, but listen to the flanger I put on the on 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 the delay on this word and this point. You know, every everything is intentional. Somebody asked a question online about something on one of the songs on the album. Um, they were talking about we talking about the high end and the bottom and how warm Elusive was his voice and everything. They were like, yeah, you know, the entire record is very warm. And there's no like harsh harshness on the top end except for this one point at the end of Ghouli, everything comes together and gets real harsh. And I'm like, that was super intentional. Well, there was a synth there that was kind of driving, and that was the one mixed note on that song where it's kind of pushing, and I distorted it some more. And the only thing Elusive said is that needs to get pushed to the to the point where it takes over the entire song, and then we let it go. And I'm like, I got you. And so saturated it more and I cranked the volume and so it's coming up and up and it's saturating and then this verse ends and it's just this synth and it crunches and crunches and I turn up so loud it's actually like making the bus compressors react so it's squishing everything and I take the entire mix and I automate it and everything comes into mono and for this one moment on the album it's just this ball of pressed mono noise and then it all blows out and everything goes back into stereo and I take that synth and then I pan it back and forth. So it's like I take everything this wide song, crunch it and and then, you know, because that's tension and that's like a songwriting thing, you know, you... When you go into the bridge, you change your chord structure and you have some harmonic tension and then you let it off when you go back into the last chorus. That's the engineering equivalent of it, is let's take everything and everything was very big and kind of open and scrunch, 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 scrunch. Yo, what is going on? Is it supposed to sound like this? This is aggressive. Do I like this? Ah. Which song is that? That's it. That's, the song is called Ghoulie. Uh, it's the end of Ghoulie. And like, that's, the, that's these moments where... It's almost it's almost breaking the fourth wall musically where it's like we've been riding here and this intense moment could be done vocally. It could be done in the beat. No, sonically we're taking this and taking you out of just where we were listening to raps and now you're sitting there as a person wondering, did something go wrong? Is this right? And it's like, oh, it was intentional. Oh, that's so dope. You made me have a physical reaction just based off of that, just based off of the mix. And that frames the musical content in a different way too. Cause I just took you out of there and I just shook your whole listening experience 
and then I threw you back in the pool, right? It resets you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it resets you. And then because after that, and obviously I'm, it's very spatial and there's a lot of reverbs and delays and panning going on. But when I took you all the way mono and all the way frequency-wise to a very narrow point, because the synth is, is not like super low. So frequency-wise, we're just here. Dynamically, we're super squashed. Everything gets so small. And now I've given you the context that when we blow that shit open afterwards, it's like, yo, now I see how wide everything was. Now I see the real landscape of how wide the song was. Let me go run that again and enjoy the lushness of that reverb that Willie Green put on this beat from the lasso, you know, or whatever it is. Let me enjoy the width of these delays on uh, Lucid's vocal uh, because I know what it could have been, right? Nothing is wide if everything is hard pan. Sometimes you got to give them that mono moment to let them know how the good they have it with the width. Yeah, and right? I love that because at the beginning you said it's about contrast. Everything. Yeah. yeah, that's it. That's it. Everything is about contrast. And yeah, sometimes take them out of the picture a little bit, toss them back in, you know. Uh, and Elucid loves to do that. It reminds me of on uh, Save Yourself, his previous solo album on Backwoods. There's one part where. The song's called If You Say So. Excellent song. Excellent album. Uh, <laughs> the first like seven seconds of If You Say So is a very loud, super piercing, super annoying, just high squeal. Like, yeah, just like that. It's super loud. And people play. I actually know people who have made a digital edit of the album where they took that part out. And that, that was something where I pushed back on Elusive. Before I was like, yo, man. I love this song. This squeal, though, I hate it. I hate it. Because you're coming out of a song before it, and, you know, everything's going, and it's loud, and you might have it up, and everything's banging, and then this squeal comes in. And you're like, why is this happening to my ears? And that's what he wants you to ask. You know what? All right, let me go to the very end, right? So this is the last 10 seconds of Bleach Water. Socially engineered in the mid 20th century. You start with African Americans being largely cut out of that uh, from the beginning. You're, you're talking about a group of people who are behind. Go uh, uh, from, from from the start. It's a very terrible sound. It's a very horrible sound. First six seconds. But if you're listening to Bleach Water, right? The song before. <laughs> Is dope. So it's all it's aggressive, but that's the kind of you don't listen to that kind of song quietly. You know, it's, you might have it up, and then even more so, there's this vocal sample. You got a lot of rumbling, but you might turn up your speakers. From beginning, I want to hear the vocal sample. So you got your volume up. And then that comes in, and people people were pissed. And I said we compromised because I was like, we at least have to turn it down because that's a terrible loud sound. He was like, no, I want it terrible loud. I want it to be jolting. I want it to be startling to people. I'm like, let me turn it down a dB. Let me turn it down a dB and a half. Just something because it's really really awful. And he was like, all right, one dB. That's it. And so that's, th that level that's on there, everybody, that's the compromise. <laughs> it was louder. The second mix revision was louder because that was his note. He's like, crank that. And I'm like, really? And I did it. And I was like, I can't, I can't live like this, you know? Um, but I like to create a physical reaction with art, you know? Like if I go to a museum or art gallery, I just walk by, I'm like, yeah, that's nice. That's nice. That's nice. That's nice. Okay, cool. But did I... If, engage with the art that I just walk by and look at it. I want you to engage with the art. So I want some physical moments. You know, that's a very aggressive one. The one on Ghouli is not nearly that sharp and terrible sounding. Um, Elucid knows that that's not... <laughs> He's well aware of the challenges with the beginning of If You Say So, but that's him too. He's like, I want to fuck with people. I want to push it. I want to make people have that reaction. It's like, okay, well, you heard that. I woke you up. What do you think of the rest of the song? You know, what about the rest of it? So, you know, there's... It serves a purpose. It's an artistic choice. You know, is the choice I would make? Maybe not. But it's my job to make it sound the way that he wants it. It's not my album. You know? Um, 
if I produced that song, I produced one song on Save Yourself called uh, New York Blanks. If I, that song does not have that sound in there. If I was the producer, I might have a little bit more say in that. But even still, like, like I said, a loose knows who he wants. If he wants that shit in there, it's probably going to be there at the end of the day. Um, and that's the wonderful thing about working with Backwoods. And, you know, to go back to what you asked me before about influential people artistically, um, Woods is not, Woods is one of the most influential people musically in my life. And not just because he's a great MC, but because he's created a label that encourages artists to push boundaries, go outside of the box. Uh, like, there's not a point, it's like, oh, this is too weird. I don't know if Backwoods can put it out. If it's good, if it's right, it can come out. We're, it's not about, well, we need to have certain pop check boxes ticked off. To, like, we're doing the weird shit. And the better the weird shit is and the weirder it is, the better off we are. And to have that kind of environment to mix records in pretty much every day. Like, I don't only work for Backwoods, but I'm involved in every Backwoods release to some degree. So with that being the idea of be creative and be dope and be unafraid about it, that has allowed me to become the musician and the engineer and the person that I am. That's, that's rare. And that's what I enjoy about the indie world more so than the major label world where it's like, well, this record needs to sound like this because it has to compete with this record and be on this playlist. I don't care about none of that. I just want to make dope records that make you think and make you react, make you feel. Like, if your music is not making you feel, what are we doing? Make you feel happy, sad, angry, whatever. If we're not doing that, we're not... We're not making music at that point. We're just making content. And that is a whole other discussion that I'm not, I'm not prepared to uh, engage in that yet. Well, where, where can they listen to the album that we've been looking at? I told Bessie, Elucid. It's probably on any platform that you normally use. Yeah. Uh, I told Bessie is out now. Um, wherever you stream your songs, it's going to be there. Uh, if you buy digital music, which you should, uh, best place is Bandcamp. Um, it's up on Bandcamp now, and if you want people to keep being able to make records that you like, it's good to make sure that they're getting the dose, they can afford to do that. Uh, and streaming as of yet is not the answer for most indie artists in that way. Um, we do a lot of physicals with Backwoods. Vinyl is coming, um, with similar to everybody else on the planet. Uh, Vinyl is just taking them forever. So vinyl will probably be sometime in the fall uh, for I Told Bessie. Uh, backwards, we still make CDs. We're one of the few. Uh, we have listeners who still buy CDs. So it'll be out on CD, it'll be out on cassette, it'll be out on vinyl. Um, so stay tuned for, for uh, the physical drops. But uh, if you head over to Backwoods Studios... And that's Z at the end of both of those because uh, it's hip hop, so we got to spell it wrong. Backwoodsstudios.com. Uh, you can cop all that stuff there. Billy Woods' whole cat catalog, my catalog, uh, everybody, you know, everyone on the label, Shrapnel, Fielded, uh, Henry Canyons, Dunce Cap, everybody. We got a lot of, a lot of very talented people. Um, and just doing unique stuff. And that's the fun part about music to me is hearing something that I haven't heard. You know, because I'm jaded. People like me and you, we listen to music all day, every day. Been doing this for a while. I've heard a lot of songs. I've heard a lot of records. Uh, so I just, I'm always on the look for some new shit. And that's what we're trying to make. Awesome. Well, this has been eye-opening for me. Thank you. I'm also just so grateful for you doing this for the audience, for me, and being so passionate and sharing it. Thank you. Yeah, I'm I'm happy to. I hope everybody, you know, is getting something out of it. I'm long-winded in my tangents, but my tangents can sometimes be dope. Uh, my wife says sometimes. Um, but yeah, you know, I love this. This is I'm I'm very lucky that I do what I love every day and that people like you want to talk about that and want to come through and talk about it with me cuz this is this is where my head is at all day, every day. So I'm very happy to talk about it. Love to come back sometime, do it again. And uh, yeah, no, I appreciate you. This has been great.